yeah, I'll, I'll present and then we'll give time for Q and A. And um, like you said, my name is Benjamin Farr. I'm currently the program manager for um, the Regenerative Organic Alliance in their Regenerative Organic Learning Center. So they have um, uh, five different farms around the country that they've chosen to uh, showcase as learning centers towards regenerative and organic um, in the tools, techniques, practices, resources to get more farmers in those bioregions certified uh, regenerative and organic. Um, this is a, a fairly new, it's a new program that they just started and they brought me on to help facilitate the uh, the rollout of it. Um, my background is in farming. I have 25 years of farming experience and have over the last 12 years um, gotten really involved in urban agriculture. And I believe that's what Dr. Jackson wanted me to speak um, more particularly about is uh, bringing organic production um, in urban agriculture uh, to people um, living in the city and the benefits of that and the ways in which we've integrated that um, through the San Francisco Bay Area. So in the chat, I put uh, a link to the design build firm company that I founded called Top Leaf Farms and it's just topleaffarms.com. Uh, if anyone wants to get in touch with me through Regenerative Organic Alliance, it's uh, Benjamin at regenorganic.org. Um, and then also farm the roof at gmail.com is more of my uh, urban ag resources there. So I kind of wear many hats. I'm wearing two right now, but um, I'm calling in from Half Moon Bay um, here on the central coast of California. So I'd like to encourage um, anyone who's in the room right now, if you want to put into the chat um, just any question that you might have that you're interested in, um, I think one of the things with this is how do we reawaken our civil imagination when we look at the infrastructure that we've inherited, um, that we're kind of designed, that's been designed for us to live in? Um, who did that, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? Someone took a pen and paper and said, this is how we're going to live in the city. This is how we're going to get our food. This is, and now we're like um, basically living that out. So um, right now is a really opportune time based in our social, economic, political realm that we live in to reimagine some different systems. And through work that you're all doing, through you know grants and different things, um, there's a intention to do just that. And we have to kind of think outside the box a little bit. So my intention today is to share a little bit of how um, I've approached that uh, problem opportunity. In that respect. So if anyone wants to um, throw anything else in there uh, that you'd like me to discuss or talk about, that would be great. Um, and I will share my screen. I have a presentation I gave to uh, Durham College um, in the spring. They had a, a urban agriculture unconference, Durham College up in uh, Toronto, outside Toronto, Canada. Um, and so I was going to share that presentation because it's applicable to this, uh, to this group. And if anyone also has questions, wants to raise their hands, I'll turn it over to the moderator here to stop me if you feel like there's something uh, important to uh, to share or to address. And I think you all can see that screen. And let's see. All right, can you all see the screen there? Me on top of a roof? Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, this idea of designing for resiliency, rewilding our urban centers through a diversified urban resilient agriculture. Uh, it's a mouthful there, but the intention, you know, is that we have these urban centers that well, the wildness has been pushed out and so has agriculture. And what is it if we integrate those two and bring it back into our cities? Um, that's kind of a, a shot of uh, a project in Berkeley. Um, that uh, was the first rooftop we did, that was in 2016. And then just a year later, what that roof looks like when given space. Um, so perennial perennial uh, beneficial insect habitat, you know, kind of falling off the side of the roof there with uh, high production um, uh, garden beds inside. Now, um, I've always loved water um, and I see that water is the driver of design. And I've been very much involved in agriculture uh, for the last 25 years. Uh, before that, I was a builder, and early on, I found a niche of building farms, 
And so I took my contracting um, love with plants together and, and then started a, um, started building. And in building the farms, there's a, when you're doing it in an ecological organic way, you're bringing in the ecosystem services, the ecosystem uh, nature, like just, I guess you're, you're accentuating that which, um, which nature does and working with nature rather than against it. And so looking at the holistic nature of what, uh, what ecology is like that place of home habitat, you know, the wildness. And so I, I bring that up only in the sense that in designing a farm and building a farm and looking at food, if we know that the supportive infrastructure is based in nature, then what we're really doing is building an, an ecosystem. And then from that ecosystem, food is produced. So it's different than building a farm that food's produced and then it's and then it supports an ecosystem. We build an ecosystem that supports the food being being produced. So that's kind of like a, a the approach within this. I have a um uh, I've been fortunate enough with a lot of privilege to live in the central um coast of California and be involved in some amazing projects. Um, three of these are on the central coast and the last one down below is one a project I did in New Zealand. I've done a ton of different design build consults. Um, but I just pull these up here as like different scales, different opportunities um, that I've had, whether it's working with nature, doing salmon restoration, working at institutes, small CSA organic farms, or eco retreat centers. The same principles apply in looking at how we um, bring wildness and food and everything integrated. Now, <laughs> this is, this is, uh, I have two kids, they're amazing. And um, we were reading in the Bernstein Bears uh, when they go to visit Farmer Ben, which they say, you're Farmer Ben. I'm like, well, yeah, sure, I can be Farmer Ben. And my, my six-year-old, he thought the book was written about me there for a minute when we came to this page. Because, you know, the question is about is farming hard or is it fun? And, you know, Farmer Ben says, yeah, it is. We love it. And actually farming is hard fun. And I think that is something that is a shift um, when we look at farming and farming communities and things is that um, how can we make it fun? And yet it still is really hard. And with the next generation coming into their awareness around food production and ways to integrate it into our built environment, there's a lot of opportunities to make it really fun, but it's still really hard work. Farming is hard work. Land, and, and yet we now have technology and tools that can also make it really engaging and really fun. Um, you know, ROA, they have these three pillars down at the bottom, but permaculture design, biophilic design, one planet, you know, there's lots of different modalities and frameworks that have utilized within, within this work. And um, Masanobu Fukuoka, give lots of reference to him because he was the one who first inspired me to start farming because I saw it more as a spiritual way of being, not just a practical way. And that's, every farmer takes things on differently. So um, fields of kale, growing food that we wish to eat in the world. I mean, these are kind of the ways in which I was approaching life and then got brought to the urban environment. And so um, looking at how to bring that scale of production into the city. And what I realized is that in the city, you have the market all around you and you also have people all around you. And when you're out on the farm and you wanna have uh, someone come over, you know, it's a two, three hour adventure sometimes for people to get out to you or, and be there. And so you don't have many folks stop by, but when you're right on the corner and you have people walking by all the time and someone's like, hey, can I, can, can I come in there and, and do something and like for 15 minutes they can put their hands in the soil and start weeding and and then also just walking by it every day and seeing food grow this is a tiny tiny eighth of an acre corner uh from a project that i'll, I'll show in here in a second that we during an entitlement for a development the developer said hey we're doing this rooftop farm do you want to use the ground level um to just do something you know anything you want to do and i said yeah that'd be great to build connection with the community, build relationship, and also show them what we're going to be doing on the roof. And um, kind of became an urban legend in this regard because of my efficiency of farming um, and producing a ton of food, but using irrigation timers and just being only having a certain amount of time in the day to, to farm. 
Um, and when you're, you know, farming five, 10 acres, and then you come into an eighth of an acre, it's a, it's easy in a certain regard. But for someone who's never farmed or just has a little back, uh, backyard, they see this as a massive, like, wow, look at all this food. And it's like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> you know, and, it's, and, it, and it was, and it was amazing. Um, and people then realizing how much food can be grown in a small space. And in urban agriculture, that is a huge benefit in the sense that Real estate is of a premium, and you start to utilize every square foot. And when you start utilizing every square foot, then you start being more efficient. Then you start looking at all the spaces. You start looking at how to stack functions. You look at how to integrate and go vertical and go horizontal and do intercropping and planting. So you start employing a lot of things that when you're out in the in the rural environment, you're not thinking about as much because you might have a couple of acres or you have you know ten or twenty or thirty acres. You're like you know, the, the 20 foot turnaround for the tractor is just the turnaround. You're not thinking about it, but here you're like, Oh man, I got this little space. I got to utilize every square inch in some regards. And so, um, the idea of bringing in regenerative agriculture is, is, is something everyone's really keen on right now. And everyone's really talking about. And I think it's important to know that regenerative agriculture in some ways is just a step in a process that is very holistic. And that process, you know, has a reckoning of understanding of kind of where we're at, where we've come from, and a certain returning to relationship to the land. And once we come to that understanding of where we are and kind of developing a, a relationship, then we go into restoration because we've extracted so much, whether it's polluting the urban environment or extracting resources from it we're left with the shadow of the abundance that once was um, wherever we go and look. And so a lot of re, um, agriculture that's talking about regenerative is really more restorative. It's restoring a balance within it. But once we kind of get to an equilibrium, then we can look at regeneration. But I like to argue or say or state that regeneration isn't just the, the end goal of like, oh, we're doing regenerative agriculture and that's the end goal, but actually it's to create a resiliency and resiliency being the durability, the fortitude of a system to weather change and challenge. And right now we're going through a lot of change and challenge with climate and within our, um, within our uh, human environment. So having a resilient system is, is kind of more of the key. Now this is um, that same corner um, right down there on the bottom corner that that, that model farm was, uh, or that demo farm was put in. And this is a, a one acre rooftop farm that we were um, going, going to design. And it was about coming into an area that there's no green roofs, there's no farms on the roof. And it's like, well, can we engage the civil imagination? And the real challenge there is the ecosystem versus the ecosystem, because there's different people that have different thoughts of how we should live and how we should be um, that aren't thinking about the ecosystem. And um, and that can be a real challenge sometimes when we're faced with development and working within the city. Um, you know, we to engage partners, architects, contractors, and create buildings that come to life was really something that inspired me of like looking at these static, non-living buildings and starting to put vegetation on structure and incorporate. These are all the renderings of a, of the project that we ended up building. That's led to some really innovative ideas working with larger developers um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. This is a Mission Rock over by the Giant Stadium and <clears throat> assessing what we have to face in the city today. You know, we have all these different things on the left there of like, you know, people are disconnected. We waste a ton of food, <clears throat> a lot of public health um, issues and different <laughs> projects. And is there a question? I heard some. No, just okay. So uh, there's different projects around the country too that are um, doing things. This is Soul Food Farm up in uh, up in Vancouver, and Michael Abelman has done. This is kind of temporary systems where there's like these bins that can basically be loaded by on a on a, on a forklift and then put into wherever vacant lots, parking lots, you know, and they and they do high production um, market garden for um, city in the city of Vancouver. Uh, Brooklyn Grange in New York is also a great rooftop farming company. And then my company, Topley Farms, this is that first project we did in Garden Village in Berkeley, 16 separate roofs, about a quarter of an acre of actual vegetated space. This uh, rooftop 
um, generated food. We are a for-profit model. And so we were trying to maximize the amount of profit we could make to pay everyone a living wage and to make the system work. And so we partnered with, with about eight different restaurants in the area that were uh, very high end. And so what was interesting about this is we were um, generating a high product, very local, hyper local, ultra fresh, getting top dollar for it. But it was also excluding food access to, you know, the people, some of the people around this area that they just couldn't afford it because we were trying to make this for profit model work. Um, I'll get back to that because that's a really important point. Um, but in developing that, we had to develop the medium for the rooftop. So we developed our own soil mix. Um, the different ways that that overburden gets engineered into the building so the building can support it. And that led to working with the landscape architect to develop all kinds of um, planters and integration into the building. So we designed that, then we built it, um, <laughs> which was, we, we blew the material up onto this roof. So this is us blowing some of that material and you can lift it with a, with a crane as well. Um, and then, you know, we, we integrated, we built it, and then we grew it. And then it was a highly productive, basically, platform of, of growing. Um, and then lots of education came in uh, once the system was up. Um, this is kind of how that roof is planted, high rotation crops of, of leafy greens mainly. It's like a salad bar up, <laughs> up in the sky. Um, but then perennial herbs and then hedgerows and beneficial insect habitat. 100% organic, certified organic. Um, and so that requires a lot more diligence to fertility management and pest management. And, and so that's where the, the diversity of the ecosystem really comes into play. Intercropping different things, taking advantage of the space, um, white Dutch clover pathways for nitrogen fixation. And then, you know, this is kind of some of the benefits of a rooftop farm. You have social, economical, and environmental and I won't go through all of these, but leave these up here for a second in that the, there's green roofs that have, um, you know, stormwater management, beneficial uh, habitat, uh, lowering the heat island effect, um, dealing with a lot of these things ecologically. But then when you incorporate a rooftop in agriculture, you start to get um, these different functions that really help, uh, especially in the social realm of engagement with people, because it's not a static roof. Green roofs are often static. They're not really managed. They're not, are not managed by uh, interactive. It's usually like a landscape company coming in. But when it's a rooftop farm, it's a dynamic space. You're harvesting, you're planting, you're engaging. And so there's a whole different dynamic that happens there. And people get, one of them is just the visual connection that people get with seeing food being grown. That is cannot be underestimated, nor can the value of a hummingbird be underestimated, nor do either of those show up on a spreadsheet. So a lot of people go, oh, what's our return of value? What's our, you know, how much are we investing in this? What are we getting out of it? And a lot of the developers, investors, equity partners, they're looking at the spreadsheet. And the value of someone's mood being altered by going up into one of these spaces on a break from work and then coming back in. I don't know how many times I've been farming and seen people come up and then they take a walk around the farm and just the, just being surrounded by, you know, the city um, and then coming up to this living space. Uh, it, that'll never show up anywhere on any, on any spreadsheet, but it has a huge, huge social impact. Um, working with students, um, integrating technology. So we're like using fertigation systems and compost tea uh, where we're injecting nutrients into the irrigation system. And this allows us to grow in a smaller medium and allows us for cycling of nutrients in a much more efficient way. You have to imagine the rooftop is like a mycelium lens on top of a building. So you have this this really rich, stable soil life with trillions of microorganisms in the city. And so you have this diversity you see, but you also have this other diversity that's underneath the soil that's living on top. The building is actually alive. Microgreen production, 800% profit margin on this stuff. It's crazy how much little bits of, of greens then and the nutrient density of it can, can have an impact. Um, these are some of the farm crops we grow. You basically can grow anything on top of the roof. 
Um, some things do better than others. And really our audit was on how much we could grow in the time, so space and time. And so corn, squash, it's kind of like, yeah, let's save that for the field. Microgreens, you know, different radishes, lettuce mixes and stuff, they, they turn over real quick. We would plant in California, we, we don't really have an off season. We're growing all year round. So we're growing some things, um, we're flipping some beds three to five times, you know, because we're only, we're growing things that are mature, dates of maturity are 30 to 45 days. So we're able to churn a lot, but then you have to be managing that, that fertility nutrients um, in, a, in a much more um, focused way. Um, working with these chefs, doing community pop-up dinners, um, you know, just beautiful produce, beautiful space, um, lots of rewilding, lots of beneficial habitat being created through native plants. Once you build it, you know, it's like build it and they will come. It's like when we started having hawks and nesting birds and all kinds of different life showing up um, on the space. So this was a really great project that we started, worked with all these different partners um, since then, doing farmlets, working with nonprofits. Um, I'm gonna skip some of this a little bit just to get into this other project and the fact that that rendering of this one, which was the second big project we did, we've, we've done a number of projects, but this was at the same developer. And we integrated a whole water system into it um, to circulate the water through the ground level before bringing it up to create that ecosystem, doing the, doing the management of the how much water. These are things that when you go, okay, we're gonna integrate a, a farm onto a building. The public utility commission's like, okay, what does that look like? How's that going to be? How much water are you going to use? You know, so you have to do all these calculations to really, you know, be clear at what you're actually putting in and how it's going to be supported and what its inputs are going to be. And so in California, you know, you can see on the top there, we have a lot of rainfall, but then by April, May, June, it's gone. And then we don't really get hardly anything during the, the hottest, driest time. So the demand gets, is, is really high. Um, but through the, you know, so you have to you have to understand what it, how much water you're actually using, and how can then once you have this idea, how can you recycle that water or use a, a buildup? So our buildup has a drain wick layer and a retention basin to it. So any water that is that runs off gets collected immediately on the roof and can get wicked up by the capillary roots of the of the plant. So it becomes much more um, efficient than say on the ground, and also the building's warm. Right. And so in the winter time, it's actually heating the soil on the roof and creating a microclimate up there. And the water that passes through the building gets a little bit warm as well. So it, the warmth of the soil and the water actually creates a better um, nutrient exchange with the plants. So there's a lot of like intricate benefits that come into play. Now, I told you about the for profit model. And one of the things that we we're launching into this next project and then COVID hit. And then the fires hit, and this is like, you know, in September, mid-morning. This is what the guys over in the Central Valley were picking cucumbers. This is what it looked like. And and I remember thinking, like, how are we going to make this roof function? Because all the restaurants are now closing down. People are, you know, we need to be growing food for people um, in a way that gives better access. And so that started asking questions like what if we actually started making this food more accessible and decommodifying the food and so my partner at the time dr maria wrote a book on inflammation and um uh, the anatomy of injustice within our food within our uh, medical system and a lot of it got down to the diet and nutrition and one of the things was that the gut is inflamed because of the food we're eating. And that makes us more susceptible to disease and challenge. And so what if we made food more accessible? What if we made organic food more accessible to those who actually needed it? And it was during COVID, black, brown, indigenous people were more susceptible to COVID because their gut was more inflamed. Why was their gut more inflamed? Because they were not having as much access to the, the foods that would make them healthy. And so what, it, what would happen if we flipped that? Why weren't they able to get that food? Well, it was often cost prohibitive. Organic, regenerative organic food is expensive. Why? Because of the labor. And so what if we started creating a different model? And so from that, 
um, this idea of integrating um, farming as medicine and, and integrating the farmers as healthcare providers. And so that created this nonprofit, the Deep Medicine Circle, um, in which we valued farmers as healthcare providers. And I was the director of agroecology and land stewardship, where we got a farm on the coast and then we integrated the farm we had just built in the urban environment to be a part of this project. And so <clears throat> we had this urban rural corridor and we started working at tools and scales. This is the farm on the coast and started looking at, okay, we're going to integrate, we're going to plant water. We're going to now integrate that, those same things onto the roof. And so we constructed the roof. Um, I won't get into the details of all the nuts and bolts of it, but uh, we installed the roof and then um, it's this is a, a bird's eye view of it right at the churn of winter to spring. So everything's just been planted. Things have been turned over, but you can see a lot of those beds in there. They're 30 inches wide, 30 feet, 33 feet long, and there's 158 of them or something. And then there's a native plants and habitat along the edges. Um, and so this this project then went into the nonprofit sector. And I really think that is a huge uh, way of integrating into urban agriculture is getting, you can do it through the for-profit realm and entrepreneurship for sure. And yet if we're looking at food access and there's often nonprofits or organizations trying to look at how to distribute food, food waste and get healthy, good, fresh organic food to people. And, and so what Deep Medicine Circle did was looking at the production and then partnering with some of these local nonprofits that had food hubs and saying, hey, we'd like to supply you with food. We'd like to supply you with the produce to distribute to your people for free. How do you do it for free? Well, you tap into relationships of, of people who have money at first, and then you get USDA grants, community food supporting grants. There's different... Uh, money available to help subsidize that but then also now with this type of farming in the city where you're looking at how do we reduce our carbon footprint food input has a lot of carbon um, transportation getting it there um, but then also the practices and how do you sequester carbon into a sink of the soil um, so there's lots of metrics that can be taken into account for a city to start reducing its carbon footprint to meet different climate goals. But then also if the food is seen as medicine, how can this food then be given and given as a prescription to community as medicine for health? And so health dollars and climate dollars going more directly towards farmers and land stewards to then offset the cost to then make food more of a, of a public benefit. And that's what Deep Medicine Circle has been working on for the last three years. And now they've got the city of uh, Oakland very excited about integrating this as a food utility. And so that's um, you know, a really, really interesting model that is wants to be replicated, you know, in different ways. Now that's a unique situation because of the different resources and relationships and opportunity. How could we replicate something like that um, in an urban environment, uh, maybe in a um, for-profit model? And there's the same tools and techniques and ways that food can be produced and then sold, whether it's through a CSA or through farmer's market. Um, the one benefit that urban farmer also has is being a broker for other farmers because the farmer here is surrounded by the market. This is on top of 265 units. There's, you know, a couple million people surrounding this area. Where are the farms? They're one, two, three hours away. They come in once a, once a week or twice a week or a couple of times a week to do farmer's markets, and they're competing. Um, so many people would come up to this farm and just be like, hey, um, can we can we get this food? And it's like, well, yeah, it looks like a lot of food, but it actually can't supply all all y'all. <laughs> and so, But there are some farms we know, and let's sign you up. And so we started... Um, basically working with other local farms to sign people up and started getting people more integrated into other CSAs. So what you have then is this kind of, this integration of rural farmers working with urban farmers to create the food system that's more robust. And, and that way then the farmers that are coming from outside the city are securing more of a market through the advocacy and through the connection and through the 
um, awareness that people are, are generating through the through the um, exposure to projects like this. So um, you know, rewilding, diversifying this urban resilient agriculture is kind of the imp 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 implication here. Um, that's my my email that people can get to me also through Benjamin at regenorganic.org. Um, but I'm sure there's some questions that people would like to ask, and I'd like to just you know, uh, can can stop sharing and see what people are interested in, and any feedback or thoughts or or ideas that you have would be great. Yes, I have a few, but the one I'm going to start with is when you talk about the nonprofit and how you could move that into a for-profit model. Have you explored anything like a prescription program where it's a reimbursement model, but not that still makes it more accessible, but the farm is still profiting. So I'm curious if you've thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is something that, uh, so there's uh, Dr. Stephen Chang. There's like a, a number of farmers or doctors in the area that have been doing um, uh, food pharmacy RX programs and they're using SNAP money to basically transfer and it's similar at a farmer's market so you can there's different farms uh, farmers markets that help facilitate that so they can take snap dollars and then turn that into real dollars for farmers and so you can basically use that um, and so it would be the similar thing just getting the farmers uh, as an aggregate set up to then start to utilize um, some of those resources and then having doctors prescribe it and then they're using medic now they're starting to find ways to integrate um, Medicare dollars and stuff into that. So someone has access and say, yeah, we're going to write this prescription. We're going to, you know, you're going to pay, co-pay $10 for, you know, $60 worth of produce or something. And so it makes it much more accessible. Now, the thing that's really important when we say food is medicine, the type of food. So it's important that it's organic. It's important that it's grown with health in mind because you can have, different foods that actually concentrate the the content the, the fertilizers and pesticides in them and then that way that actually can make make it not medicine and actually be more inflammatory to the system so if you're using glyphosate roundup and it's going in to desiccate the wheat you know to dry the wheat out for harvest that wheat those kernels they actually absorb it like a little sponge and then our wheat then has glyphosate contaminants in it they bioaccumulated that anything that's made from that then will then get um, into the system now big adults don't bioaccumulate as much as kids right because they're small small little bodies and they accumulate a lot more so we have to be aware of some of these practices and inputs and that's why it's really important that organic we, we see organic and you know organic's just an input regenerative is the technique and so regenerative organic is like the ecological way of growing food that takes everything into consideration, it takes in the waterways, it takes in the, the bees, the butterflies and everything, and it can have a benefit on your, on your system too. So, so there's um, in Oklahoma and different places, there's some really great, um, really great people. Um, I'm trying to remember her name, Erin, uh, not Erin Moses, but um, she's in Oklahoma and she's really gaining a lot of traction on food is medicine and getting people um, really uh, understanding that concept. We have a very new uh, prescription program in South Dakota that is in the pilot phases. So um, it's exciting. Um, yeah. I think they're at about 75 shares, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, when you talk about like glyphosate and some of those uh possible contaminations in this group we talk a lot about risk management that seems to be a possible or, or a popular topic of interest can you talk a little bit about how your risk management plan might look different in an urban setting versus a rural setting um which type of risk management are you talking about like specific for organic production i mean in this group we talk a lot about uh, like drift over spray and i don't imagine that the same issues are as much of a problem in an urban setting so i'm just curious what issues you come across or what might be different yeah. for an urban 
harm. Yeah, there's different risks, of course, different, um, you know, the, the drift of pesticides and other, you know, runoff isn't as the same in a rural environment, but you have other types of drift as far as pollution or other types of runoff, you know, so soils are a big part in the urban environment. Often our soils are contaminated um, with lead or arsenic or other minerals, metals, um, breaks, you know, into the street and that gets run off and often gets put into soils and then bioswales great, but then they're bioaccumulating different heavy metals. So, you know, that's, that's one benefit of the rooftop. You're engineering a medium that you're growing in, but even on the ground, often you have to, uh, you know, create a different type of soil that you're growing in because the soil there might need to be, uh, remediated quite a bit um, and you can do that but it's that's one big risk is like making sure you have the right soil that's why a lot of people grow hydroponic and different things in the city um, the the predation is different you know like here on the rural we got lots of deer and gophers and stuff there's no gophers on the roof I often joke if, if a gopher shows up on the roof I'm done I don't I give up <laughs> But we do have crows and we do have birds and, you know, there's other things that are up there. And then insects become, um, you know, because what happens, too, is you have isolation. Um, and so something that might go in balance can get compounded really quickly, similar to in a greenhouse. You have an aphid breakout or something. And in the city, you sometimes have 10, 15, 20 degrees difference heat, you know. So you, that can be seen as a benefit and, and microclimate that you can take advantage of. But it also can throw off. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, this is a cool weather crop. And all of a sudden you're like in cool weather. But because you're in the city, it's 20, it's 15 degrees warmer. And at night, too, because the concrete radiates back out, you know, the, the heat at night. So you have to observe and manage and understand the um, uh, the little nuances in that regard as far as the microclimates and, and crime. There's crime sector. And in the and pollution sector, you know, people leaving stuff, um, throwing stuff in who just, you know, waste and things. So you have different sectors that you have to be conscious of. Um, the um, the water is different. You know, it often sometimes has, um, you have to treat it a little different than if you're pulling from a stream or something out in the environment. Um, and then the scale is just, it's it's so small even like a one acre rooftop is like huge it's the biggest one on the west coast but it's one acre you know you go one acre farm out in the rural environment you're like oh yeah i got a one acre farm that's cool little market garden you know and as opposed to you know 20 30 acres or something it's kind of like there's like a 10x type of uh, feeling you know something that is feels like oh this is a 10 acre rural farm okay we're producing food it's the same kind of feeling in the urban environment with a one acre farm you know you feel you feel that same like value of production and um uh the the so the sense of scale is something when you're doing risk management you kind of have to understand that small mistakes or problems get exacerbated in the urban environment because of the scale is so nuanced and so tight sometimes so those are some of them there was a comment left after my question uh that mentions smog in the urban rooftop environment and animal or bird droppings are either of those anything that you've run into you know um that the smog part was something we thought of uh, especially when we were on the ground level because um we had exhaust and particulates from the from the, the cars and stuff um in the San Francisco Bay Area, we have the ocean right there. And so there isn't like ever really a smog effect that happens where we get like heavy pollution and often gets blown out through it. But there is particulates, especially on crops like say cabbage or something that's in the ground for 90 days. You know, you're going to have like some things. But um, there was a, 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 a doctor, um, well, a, what was his position? He was over at UC Berkeley. Um, he's a professor. And he was doing um, plant nutrient density studies on wild plants and looking at wild foraging and the nutrient density of that. And he had the same question, like, is there a contamination that's happening within wild plants? Because we also know that wild plants are often bioaccumulators. They accumulate whatever contaminants are and they concentrate them. And through a lot of plant sap analysis, he realized that it, it's so minimal. There's, there's really not 
not that type of accumulation that you might think of, you know, because I was like, oh, what's going to happen? Like these lettuces, and he's like, no, you just wash it off and it's fine. And sure, we wash it off. And we did two plant sap analysis and they were so, they like minimal traces. It wasn't even like effective. So um, now that's different. Integrate chickens, all right? Chickens are scratching in the soil. They can bioaccumulate lead in their eggs. So lettuces, greens, different things have different ways their plant, their roots can be in ground that has arsenic or lead. They won't accumulate that in their actual leaves. It's the dust of the ground that might get on the plant that then gets accumulated and eaten or into the thing. So it's like there's ways to mitigate and understand, um, but then also like the lead with chickens, that's, that's an issue that happens. People don't think about that. So you have to find your UC or your extension office or whoever you're working with um, in testing around contaminants. That's always a first step with the soil is, is testing that. Now, bird droppings, I've had more bird droppings on the farm on the coast than in the urban environment because there's just like, we've there's so much more habitat. And the bird droppings that, you know, it's so minimal that it's not really a concern in the, in the city. Um, now, if you had, if you were in some place where there is a ton of like pigeons or different things where they might accumulate, it usually takes about three to five years before they find it all. So the first three years are kind of the golden years where, you know, it has, it's not on the radar of the, of the plant, of the, of the birds and stuff, you know, but then after about three years, they start to find it. And if you do it right, there can be a balance. If you do it wrong, there can be an imbalance and you can have issues start to arise. But then after seven or 10 years, like in any ecosystem that you integrate into, it usually finds its balance again. But having the hawks, having owls, like we had some, we had this, uh, we had great horned owls show up in downtown Oakland on the roof, you know, and it was like hooting away. And we're like, that's a great horned owl. <laughs> What's it doing up here? You know, and like hawk, red tail hawks and all kinds of stuff. Cause Imagine you're a bird and you're flying over saying you just see this oasis, you know, you're like, okay, let's go check that out, you know, and, and resident hummingbirds and different things. So it becomes a really, and that's also, there's often nonprofits and people looking at how to incorporate more nature and more pollinator habitat in the urban environment. So one of the really cool things about integrating urban agriculture, when you're doing it in an ecological way, there's often other groups that are trying to meet your same goals. There's often pollination habitat, stormwater management, and you know these different things that are trying to be boxes that are trying to be ticked. And the farm can actually support those and create some of those if done in that same way of management. So it can serve lots of different functions. Great question, though. Interesting. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Does anyone else have any questions? Tina asked this question about how deep the soil is on the roof and oh. we grow like 10 inches um, is like kind of our golden spot. We've gone down to six and eight and it tends to be a little more difficult, but 10 inches, 10 to 12, it doesn't really need to be more than 12 inches. Um, you would think tomatoes, and but now again, this is, there's monolithic uh, uh, frame here, you know, our, our uh, horizontal root growth that can happen. It's not, it's not just in a box, right? So they have space to go left and right as well. So they can run pretty good. That was one thing on there. And it weighs, you know, it does have a weight to it. So you have to engineer the roofs to meet that. Or if you're doing a retrofit on a building, you find the load bearing walls. You find the walls that can, you know, the supports that you can put something on top of or um, retrofit it. It often costs more to retrofit the building than it's worth, but Pre-1940, a lot of the buildings before 1940 were designed and built in a way to withstand a lot more weight than they actually needed. So a lot of concrete buildings and stuff. Yeah. I'm also curious where everyone's from. Like, are you all from all over South Dakota or is it a specific one area? Like who the people who will be listening to this in the future? Is it kind of the whole state? Our organization covers the whole state. Um, on this call, we have some from the Southeast quarter, uh, and then Denise, she's right in the middle. Um, they have organic grains and wheat. Well, and Tina's from the Black Hills, so uh, one from each side in the middle. 
what's the big um what are the cities that would be incorporating urban agriculture do you think would be like the the ones that would be more um receptive i guess to something like this yeah um tina commented rapid city definitely rapid city and sioux falls in the sioux falls area we actually have iron fox farm which is a they turned a vacant lot into a farm and they um do a lot with the local schools they host uh, a community composting program on the same land uh, and so that's always the one that comes to mind for me when I think of urban ag in South Dakota uh, but I would say Rapid City and Sioux Falls would definitely be the first. Nice and what would be um, what would you say would be some of the, the main hurdles or or things that would stop or that would be you know kind of resistant to integrating urban agriculture it's a good question um it reminds me of conversations i've even had about uh soil health or um cover cropping and just getting started getting more information kind of uh getting over the hurdle of the unknown or that my family's always done it this way or this is how a garden is maybe supposed to look in our minds uh i think yeah so we've got lack of understanding someone to head up a plan denise you mentioned that so it's like not resistance but kind of like yeah so that's often the case is like some people are like yeah that sounds great like who's gonna do it how are we gonna do it or like the person just integrating or like introducing the idea you know that idea of the imagination like there's a, like i had the city of phoenix come up to the rooftop and they were like okay how did you do this how does it work what's that you know and it's just like i didn't know you could do it like this and i didn't know a building does the building does the roof leak and it's like no 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 you don't want, so the roof you don't want it to leak you don't want it to you know do these things and here's and there's all the technology they've been doing it in europe for for decades and there's now decade old uh farms here in this country doing it on the roof very successfully um and and medical centers so denise you also asked about medical centers doing this um the boston medical center is probably the one that's the most high profile integrating rooftop farm onto the medical center itself um and the food going down into the cafeteria and then also going we uh, when I was working with the Deep Medicine Circle, we worked with UC San Francisco, UCSF, and their clinic um, did a uh, every other week farmer's market. And then on the other weeks, they would do um, food distribution where they would work with local food banks. And then they worked with us where then they would just put up a pop up with the thing and they just had all the food there and any of the clients and clients could come and get food for free. It was just part of it was just a service being offered through the through the medical center saying like, hey, food is valuable. It's good. Let's make sure you get good, healthy food. So they would work with local food banks to get the money and then they would just be an aggregate of distribution to their uh, to their um their patients who were often those of lo of lower income and so they didn't have the access to the food and so there's a lot of food banks food hubs um but often they're using uh food waste they're like redistributing food that would normally be wasted that's still good but it's also old you know it's like broccoli that's seven days old i don't really like to eat that <laughs> you know and so people coming to food hubs are like yeah okay and then the biggest change was when we started integrating our food that was market ready harvest fresh it like been harvested that day or the day before getting that food kind of up the bar and some and then now a lot of the food banks here are also working with local farmers to go direct not as a not as a fallout of what they didn't sell at the farmer's market but actually they've gotten federal and state dollars to go to the farmer and say hey we like to buy five cases of beets and 20 cases of lettuce from you every other week the farmer's like great you know and they're paying them the right money but they're using federal and state dollars for community food um programs and stuff so there's a lot of usda money that's specifically through the national um institute of food and agriculture nifa 
they actually have, um, and through the you know current Biden administration, they've reallocated millions of dollars to NIFA to distribute and basically offer these three-year grants. And Deep Medicine Circle got two of these grants in order to, first it was kind of boosted up by philanthropy and people wanting to invest, you know, in different institutes. But then that gave enough of a push to sh prove a model that then we were able to get USDA grants to help with that. So, yeah, feeding SD. Okay, that's a great connection there. Feeding South Dakota, yeah. And I heard too that like in South Dakota, um, organics isn't as um, kind of widespread as far as people's knowledge on, on organic agriculture and the values of organic food. Is that true? Yeah, there's definitely not as much of a spread. Maybe Glenn can speak more to this if he's um, able to talk, but I believe that even Dr. Jackson and our new transition to organic program, uh, that's the first time in the state where uh, free technical assistance for transitioning producers is available. Uh, so we're starting to try to bridge that gap, but I see you unmuted. So I'm going to let Glenn talk about that. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a big interest in organic in South Dakota, but a lot of times the initial interest that somebody has is kind of squashed by our own department of ag with South Dakota's not necessarily organic friendly for right. producers, but we've learned that, you know, through a lot of work and diligence, you can navigate that if you really put your mind to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would say the environment's changing and it also varies a little bit community to community. I'm in Vermilion, which is a, which is a home of the university of South Dakota. And our community is pretty, pretty open to organic. There's, you know, they, pursue they'll, they'll come and find us some of the other communities maybe not so much we are going to also be trying a little test next year we also we have a church and a daycare and we have leased some acreage behind it that's zoned agriculture within a city and we're actually going to do a, a market garden there and market food through the daycare help the kids learn how to plant seeds take the food all the way up through harvest and then actually serve that and send that home with with their parents so it's gonna be a little experiment we're doing next year as part of that that's great that's great well if there's if there's ways to uh support or offer up um you know insights or presentation or connection to anyone of influence or or support of you know getting these ideas too or because often sometimes it's just answer helping answer some questions or dispelling doubt um or providing other resources because organics is just one step right that's just the input you can still practice very industrial farming practices with organic inputs which is what they do a lot here in california um bigger bigger resistance is when the, the farmers have to change their management practices you know and the ways in which they till or not till or integrate other you know aspects but hopefully we can um offer up some other incentives you know through some of these um you know Re reduction inflation act and whatnot there's a lot of money from the nrcs that's coming down from the federal government for conservation soil conservation habitat conservation uh, ecological um, land stewardship management, um, these all have dollars attached to them um, when farmers and land stewards start incorporating them um, for cleaner waterways, healthier, you know, less soil erosion, things like that. And that's just a matter of uh, then exposing farmers to these programs and then being like, yeah, if you want to do that, there's no incentive, but actually there is now. Here's some other incentives that are available for you to do that. You don't have to pay uh, out of pocket to create beneficial insect habitat. There's actually money available for you to do that. And once you have that, switching to organic or transitioning to organic um, becomes easier because you have beneficial insect habitat to help manage bad bugs, things like that. You know, so just different processes that, that are available. So yeah, if there's any 
any way to contribute more ideas, whether it's through Gen of Organic Alliance or through myself as a consultant or whatever, please, uh, please let me know. And I'm just so grateful to be uh, invited to share. And, to, um, and I hope, um, again, farm the roof at Gmail or Benjamin at regenorganic.org. If anyone has any insights now in this call or future recordings, please, uh, please reach out and um, let's, let's continue to build a better uh, food system. Thank you so much for joining us. You're so welcome. You're so welcome.